फुटबॉल में सुना फ्रांस प्लीज बीस फ्रेंच मेयर्स रैली द पब्लिक इन एन एफर्ट टू डिसकंटिन्यू द एस्केलेटिंग वायलेंस फ्लैश फ्लड्स China encounters severe weather as heavy rainfall lashes regions in southwestern China. Lethal shootings. Yet more lives lost following even more bouts of mass shooting this time in Philadelphia. Chunba celebration. Fireworks turn China skies into a vibrant work of art. This is other there in a world news tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening, and you are watching Colombo. We start off tonight with updates on severe weather alerts in China. Three yellow flag alerts have been issued by local hydrological monitoring station in southwest China's Zhongling municipality, with a heavy rainstorm hitting 24 districts and swelling multiple rivers. According to the hydrological monitoring station 24 districts in Chongqing have been engulfed by the heavy rain. The largest daily rainfall of 251.5 mm was reported in Wanzhou district pushing the water level to the Moldau stream in the region to surge to close to 12 to 13 meters over a few hours very close to the alert water level. The city's flood control and drought relief authority initiated a flood control emergency response. Chongqing is not alone in facing potential flooding. Heavy rain also struck areas in its neighboring provinces of northwest China's Shaanxi and southwest China's Sichuan province. Provinces. Shaanxi has experienced widespread rain causing several sections of roads in some towns and cities to become impassable. Zhenba County in the city of Hanzhou encountered a very rare super heavy rainstorm which reportedly happens only once every 50 years. Some 4533 people have been evacuated and the economic losses are expected to surpass 120 million yuan. Torrential rain in the city of Baozhang in Sichuan has damaged crops sand causing waterlogging in low lying areas. Some underground parking lots were flooded due to rainwater backflow resulting in submerged vehicles The Ministry of Housing and Urban Rural Development and the Ministry of Emergency Management issued a notice requiring all regions to further improve their emergency mechanisms for drainage and flood control to ensure the safety of cities during this year's flood season. Meanwhile, Taiwan's military carried out five fire drills on its strategically located southern coast, firing missiles from highly mobile armored cars to destroy targets close to shore in a simulation of repelling invading forces. Camouflage Taiwan Army Humvees rolled around the coastal drill area in Pingtung County's Fangshan near the far southern tip of the island before firing off US-made TOW anti-tank missiles to destroy static targets near the shoreline. Pingtung, which looks out to the Taiwan Strait, South China Sea, Pacific Ocean, and Baoshi Channel that separates Taiwan from the Philippines, is a highly strategic spot to watch Chinese military activity and a potential landing site in an invasion. Taiwan, which China claims as its own territory despite the island's strong objections, has faced in recent years almost daily missions by Chinese military aircraft often in the southwestern part of the island's air defense identification zone. China has ramped up military pressure over the past 3 years to try to assert its sovereignty claim and the island's armed forces routinely practice seeing off a Chinese attack. Taiwan's defense ministry spokesperson Son Li Fang told reporters after the live drill that the eight Chinese aircraft crossed in the median line of the Taiwan Strait. In a statement released after Son's remarks, the defense ministry said a total of 24 Chinese warplanes including fighter jets and bombers was spotted near Taiwan. It added that four Chinese These warships also joined a joint combat readiness patrol. Hong Kong police placed a one million dollar bounty on eight prominent democracy activists in self-imposed exile in a move strongly condemned by rights groups and Western governments. The activists, including former lawmakers Leta Lo, Dennis Kwok, and Ted Hui. have been accused of violating national security offences ranging from collusion and foreign forces to subversion of state power having imprisoned most of the city's democratic opposition hong kong authorities are now going after exiled activists the hong kong police's national security department announced monday it was applying arrest warrants for eight pro democracy figures including four former legislators 咁我哋警方咧係相當高度重視呢啲咁嘅案。Because our police force is highly concerned about these cases, we will offer a reward of a million, a million Hong Kong dollars for each wanted person, in the hope that the public will come forward to offer relevant information about these cases. 或者相關嘅案件提供消息。The sum is the equivalent of 117,000 euros. The activists, seven men and one woman, range in age from 26 to 74, and include the former student leader Nathan Law, who currently lives in the UK. 
The alleged offences pertain to the 2019 protests and the following year when the draconian national security law used to prosecute the eight was introduced. What did they do? Firstly, they committed serious crimes that endanger national security. Secondly, they advocated for sanctions and sought to disrupt our Hong Kong and intimidate our Hong Kong officials, among other things. Some of them specifically targeted judges and prosecutors for sanctions. Hong Kong insists its national security law has extraterritorial force, but the activist countries of residence are unlikely to accede to any request to arrest or extradite them, given the vague nature of the charges and also because the law is retroactive. Some are also citizens of other countries such as Australia and Japan. But the announcement will have a further chilling effect on pro-democracy sentiment in this Chinese autonomous region and also among the city's diaspora. Riots in France appear to be calming after five days of violent protests in response to the shooting of a teenager during a police traffic stop. A further stabilize the settling peace, French mayors called for rallies to be held outside town halls to protest the violence and looting. The mood was somber but defiant at a gathering in the French town of La Isle Rose, one of many outside town halls across the country. This rally was in solidarity with the town's mayor, whose home was attacked over the weekend by rioters enraged by the police shooting of a teenager of North African descent. Nous avons vu le vrai visage des émeutiers. The mayor himself, Vincent Jean Bourne, said rammed a vehicle into his home Saturday evening while his wife and children were asleep inside and set it alight. This woman who works in La Isle Rose said she found the violence inexplicable in what she thought was an extremely calm town with very civic people. This man said the death of Nahil, the teen shot by police, was inexcusable, but he didn't see the connection with attacking the mayor and said there was a general feeling of disproportion with what happened. Tension appears to have ebbed across the nation with fewer arrests on Monday compared to previous days of riots that were triggered by the fatal police shooting of Nahil M last week. The incident tapped into a deep vein of resentment towards police and what some Muslim communities of North African descent say is a long history of racial profiling and sparked days of riots that left behind torched cars and looted stores and properties owned by the state. However, rather than focus on race, far-left and far-right lawmakers on Monday blamed failures in government policies for the riots. Prime Minister Elizabeth Bourne acknowledged some soul-searching should happen for the administration, but that will only come after order is restored. The crisis brings up numerous questions, and the different parliamentary group presidents had the opportunity to speak about these topics. But I think we'll have the opportunity to meet again, to pursue and to go deeper in these conversations. In any case, today our priority is to ensure the return of Republican order with a kind of order maintained tonight and with a strong criminal response. French President Emmanuel Macron has postponed a state visit to Germany to deal with the crisis. He's set to speak to more than 220 mayors on Tuesday of towns and cities that were affected by the riots. Just a day after two people died and 28 were injured in a shooting attack in Baltimore, Maryland, authorities confirmed that a gunman wearing a bulletproof vest opened fire along several blocks in southwestern Philadelphia, a shooting that left four people dead and two children injured. A shooting Monday night in Philadelphia left at least four people dead, according to police. Two children, who were 2 and 13 years old, were injured but in stable condition. Clips from local news outlets showed police cordoning off an intersection in Kingsessing on Monday where the gunfire had erupted. Authorities took in a suspected shooter, a man believed to be in his 40s, into custody. Police said he had a bulletproof vest and a police scanner and didn't appear to have any connection to the victims. Philadelphia Police Chief Danielle Outlaw said a second suspect is also in custody. At some point, as victims were being shot, we have another person that we believe acquired a gun somehow, don't know how, and picked up the gun and returned fire in the direction of the shooter that we have in custody. So we're still trying to sort everything out. So we have three guns recovered, 
two people in custody. It came only a day after another shooting in Baltimore, Maryland, where two people were killed and 28 others injured, around half of them children, at an outdoor party. Police said they were still seeking multiple suspects in that shooting. We'll be back with more world news after a short commercial break. Welcome back. Israel's biggest military operation in years in the occupied West Bank continued for a second day, leaving at least 10 Palestinians dead and forcing thousands to flee their homes as the government said it struck the militant stronghold with great strength. Palestinians raise their hands in front of Israeli forces as they leave their homes in Janine camp, pushed out by a major Israeli army raid. Hundreds of families have been evacuated, helped by the Palestinian Red Crescent Association. They told us to leave our houses and leave them open. We left our clothes, belongings, money behind. The deputy governor of Janine said they were looking to house the families in schools and other shelters in the city of Janine. As firefights and explosions rocked the adjacent refugee camp, a militant stronghold home to about 15,000 people. Palestinian gunmen fought intense street battles throughout Monday against Israeli troops equipped with armoured vehicles, bulldozers and drones for strikes. I was standing in the kitchen when a bomb exploded. I felt that the world caught on fire, as if the house exploded within us. There have been regular Israeli army operations in cities like Janine for over a year in response to an escalation of violence across the West Bank. But this is the biggest raid in 20 years. We will continue this operation as long as needed to restore quiet and security for the citizens of Israel. The Israeli Prime Minister said the raid was putting an end to terrorism in Janine, but for many Palestinians, it is instead stoking it. No matter how much blood you shed of our children, our elders and our women, this will only increase our determination to achieve an honourable life. Arab countries with normalized ties with Israel, like the United Arab Emirates, also condemned the incursion. While the United States said that though Israel had a right to defend its people, it called for protection of civilians. Russia will continue to oppose Western sanctions, President Vladimir Putin has said, following Moscow's invasion of Ukraine. His address to Virtual Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit was his first to an international meeting since last month's mutiny in Russia. For more updates on the aftermath of the Wagner uprising, we have out there in a world news special correspondent, Malsha Patiraja from St. Petersburg in Russia. Malsha? Yes, Sarvi. President Putin is directing a major damage limitation exercise in Russia to reimpose his authority and purge those responsible for the potential coup attempt. Following Yergeny Prigozhin, a body of March was justice towards the Russian capital last weekend. The Kremlin said that all government agencies and the ministries, including the intelligence services, were and had been working as they should in the contest of the Martini by the mercenary fighters. The Wagner Group signs and all Wagner insignia were removed from the Wagner Center business block in St. Petersburg. The building was opened in November 2022 and was seen as a major step by the Wagner Group founder Yergenemy Prigozhin to publicize his military credentials and take a more public role in shaping Russia's defense policy. Meanwhile, Russian news agencies have said five drones have been donned en route to Moscow in what Russia is calling a Ukrainian terrorist attack. Several flights that were scheduled to land at Moscow's Noko airport have been diverted to other airports. Back to you, Sanami. Thank you. That was Adha Derna World News Special Correspondent Malsha Patiraja from St. Petersburg in Russia. UN Nuclear Chief Rafael Grossi is in Japan to deliver his agency's final report regarding Tokyo's upcoming discharge of Fukushima radioactive wastewater into the Pacific Ocean. Let's take a look. The head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Rafael Grossi, arrived in Tokyo on Tuesday to deliver the agency's comprehensive report on Tokyo's plan to release wastewater from the Fukushima nuclear power plant into the ocean. He plans to hand it over to Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida during a meeting scheduled later in the afternoon. 
During his four-day visit in Japan, he will also travel to the Fukushima Daiichi plant to inspect the site and visit an IAEA office there, which will newly open upon his visit. After wrapping up his trip to Japan, Grassi will also visit South Korea from Friday to Sunday to provide an explanation of the report to the Korean government. He will sit down for talks with the country's foreign minister, Park Jin, and the chairperson of the Nuclear Safety and Security Commission, Yugo Ki. The IAEA is widely expected to give Japan the green light for the release, as it has been saying that the samples of the wastewater from the Fukushima plant meet requirements. In its previous six reports, the agency said it found the country's measurement of the treated water to be, quote, accurate and precise. After receiving the report, the Japanese government plans to announce the exact schedule for the release, a process that will be carried out over the next three to four decades. But even if the IAEA confirms the safety of the water, South Korea will likely continue to ban imports of seafood from Fukushima until the South Korean public feels it is safe enough to consume. The country's ruling party and the opposition party on Monday discussed countermeasures and said that restrictions on seafood imports from the region will continue for an unspecified period of time until public consensus changes. The UN Security Council ended a decade-old peacekeeping mission in Mali after the ruling military demanded the withdrawal of the international force battling an armed rebellion without delay. It marks the end of the UN peacekeeping mission in Mali, known as MINUSMA. Of the voting On Friday, the UN Security Council unanimously adopted the resolution, but many representatives made it clear that they had done so reluctantly. While we deeply regret the transition government's decision to abandon MINUSMA and the harm this will bring to the Malian people, we voted in favor of this resolution as we are ultimately satisfied with the drawdown plan this council has just adopted. Some went even further. We do not believe that partnership with the Wagner Group will deliver long-term stability or security. Russia, on the other hand, hailed the vote, saying it was a response to Mali's sovereign decision requesting the UN peacekeepers to leave the country. The withdrawal process of MONESMA will start on July 1st and end on December 31st, 2023. The government of the Republic of Mali is attached to the commitments that were made in this regard and will make sure they are respected. The Malian government is open to cooperating with all partners who wish to do so. MINUSMA was created in 2013 after separatist rebels and extremist insurgents occupied northern Mali. But since then, the authorities have drastically reduced the scope of the UN mission. The Malian government says it has failed to bring security after 10 years in the country. Welcome back. For more news, let's take around the world in a minute. An explosion tore through a building in downtown Tokyo, scattering debris across a busy intersection and sending smoke into the air. But the fire was soon contained and only four people suffered light injuries. Leon Gauthier, the last surviving member of the French commando unit that waded ashore on D-Day alongside the light troops to begin the liberation of France, has died. He was 100 years old. Indonesian President Joe Covidodo was greeted by Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese as he received a ceremonial welcome in Sydney. The green economy and easing of business visits for Indonesians and regional security will be discussed during the meeting of both sides. Inter Milan's Croatia midfielder Masalo Brzovic has joined Saudi Arabia's Al Nasser on a three-year contract. The financial details were not disclosed, but Italian media said the transfer fee was 18 million euros. Meta Platform plans to launch a microblogging app. Threats. The launch comes after Twitter announced a state of restrictions on the app, including the need to be verified in order to use Twitter. That is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Atadarina English. We end tonight in China as fireworks were lit up at a rural basketball game nicknamed as the Chinese Chunba Games in southwest China's Zhuzhou province. The display of fireworks created a dazzling and touching atmosphere. Thank you for watching and have a great rest of your life.